Hey y'all, welcome to VJH Creations, a channel dedicated to reviewing TTRPG products, learning new systems, giving first time and long time GMs game advice, and breaking down some of the ways in which bigotry has influenced the space and work of TTRPGs. I'm VJ, I'm a pro GM and professional TTRPG designer. I had the immense pleasure to receive an alpha preview of Stoneburner. Let's play the clip. Stoneburner is a solo-friendly TTRPG of demon hunting and community building in a dwarven asteroid mine. Developed by René Pierre de A. Gelina and Galen Pajau, published by Fari RPGs. Brokir Longneck of House Grand Rock has passed away and you are his only surviving relative. In his will, Brokir has bequeathed to you the cursed mines of the Longbelt, its dilapidated settlement, and the leadership of House Grand Rock. However, other dwarf houses seek to overthrow you and take control of the valuable minerals hidden deep within those cold tunnels. To complicate matters further, most of the mine's galleries are inaccessible due to them being haunted by fire-spitting demons from the underworld. The Universe The universe is large, but the human corpse, the dwarven houses, and the elfic clans are at the center of it all. All fantasy cultures have populated the galaxy using spaceships powered by dwarven-engineered FTL engines. There are people from all backgrounds in each city, ship, space station, corporation, mine settlement, and haven. The social center of the universe revolves around the planet-wide city of Hammerside. Each district, city, planet, system, and space station have their own laws and customs. This makes every destination unique and exciting. There are orcs, goblins, trolls, fays, centaurs, gnomes, undead, dragons, ghosts, and any fantasy culture you can think of. And the world. There are huge corporations looking at every opportunity to turn a profit. Nothing will get in their way. There are pirates, bounty hunters, criminals, outlaws, rebels, and more. The galaxy is too big to keep an eye on everyone. Technology is advanced, but often intertwined with the arcane. On some worlds, this will look glossy and high-tech, rusted and old on others. Magic is mystical, powerful, consequential, and most importantly, unpredictable. There are other realities, and it is possible to traverse from this one to the other by means of dangerous portals, rituals, and spells. The world of Stoneburner is complex, political, and dynamic. Anything is possible. Play to find out what happens next. Now that you've gotten the spiel, let's dig into it. Coming in at 68 pages, Stoneburner is a quick and easy read. In preparation for explaining and playing the game, you can click on the link here to go check that out. I read it three times, but after the first time, had a pretty good handle on the system and how it works. And the other two times were specifically because my memory is garbage and I reread as much as I can. To play, you need sets of polyhedral dice, D4, D6, D8, D10, D12, D20, printed copies of the game's character and rules reference pamphlet, pencils, and slips of paper. There is a digital character sheet made in Google Spreadsheets, and I managed to play this game with all digital tools, save for the physical dice you need. Um, you do need those to be physical for at least one part of the game. Character creation is easy and straightforward. The game obviously operates under the assumption that you are in some way related to a dwarven ancestor. That doesn't mean you yourself have to be a dwarf or that you can't be a biracial character, but regardless of what your race is at the start of the game, the choice is purely aesthetic and what it means for world building since there are zero, <laughs> you heard it, zero mechanical benefits across the races. Background and class are rolled into one with kits. There are five kits, the Stanchion, a powerful warrior dedicated to guarding people, stories, and their legacies. Stanchions bravely protect, rescue, and record. The Sounder, a perceptive hunter known for the ability to find lost and stolen things and people that disappear or flee. Sounders learn, track, hunt, and discover. The Striker, a nimble warfighter who spent their life as a commando or mercenary. Strikers take point, move fast, and break things. There's the Spellwinder, a powerful wound caster that calls to the true names of the rocks around them. Spellwinders know truths, seek answers, and channel powerful magic. The Sinker, a brilliant mechanic that makes it possible to dive to the deepest depths. Sinkers repair, create, and support. For each kit, there are three unique background options which ask three questions to help build out your character. There are three skills, strength, covering your physical prowess, dexterity, determines your agility and finesse, and willpower, your mental capabilities. In each kit, a D4, D6, or D8 represent the effectiveness of each of your skills. You also get two artifacts unique to, unique to each kit, which typically enhances a weapon or an item you are wearing slash carrying on your person. These artifacts use a D6 and a D8 to represent their effectiveness. 
Each kit has a short list of facets, items that you always have access to and can use throughout the game. They range from weapons and armor to determination and life experience. Finally, you have five abilities. Each ability requires a certain amount of energy or charge to activate a powerful and rule-breaking stunt. Once you've settled on which kit you're going with, there's a few more options to go through. You don't automatically gain access to both artifacts or all of the abilities upon character creation. Your first artifact is marked with an X, but with your abilities, you get to choose which one you want, and if it's hard to decide, the first one listed is always a safe bet. Throughout gameplay, you gain access to more artifacts and abilities. Now, you may have noticed we didn't mention anything about hit points or resilience as it's known in the game. Everyone, regardless of what kit they choose, have the same amount of hit points, 1d4 plus 2, so bare minimum you get 3 points and max you get 6. Finally, to end the character creation, you need to determine how much money or credits you have by rolling 1d4 times 100. Taking into account having to read all of the kits, figure out which background and what abilities you want, character creation can take around 30 to 45 minutes at most. A little water break, y'all. While talking about the kits, I mentioned a bunch of dice, D4, D6, D8s. I mentioned the cost of things like charges, but what does that mean? Whenever you go to perform a check, you determine what item or skill you're using. Let's take the stanchion. If I wanted to lift a boulder in the way, I would use my strength and roll a D8 because that's the die associated with my strength. Let's actually roll a dice though. Okay, I got a six, which means I greatly succeed in lifting this boulder out of our path. After using my D8 strength die in this manner, it drops down to a D6. Each time I use a skill or item with a die associated with it, it drops down to the next lowest die all the way until it's a D4. And the D4 is the lowest you can go. Now, while abilities don't have dice associated with them and just work, it still costs dice to use them. The Stanchion has an ability called Overcharge and it costs two charges. Using the power of your jetpack and the resistance of your shield, you may charge at one target with immense strength. This lets you easily break things that are in the way. There aren't a lot of things in the universe stronger than the metal of your shield. When using your charge during combat, you directly cause three hits to your target during your turn. Instead of rolling any dice for this, I choose one or more dice to decrease equal to the number of charges it costs. So if I had a D8 in strength, my D8 would drop to a D4. Now, let's say I've already used my strength and it's a D6. I can't decrease my die past a D4, but I can decrease my willpower die from a D6 to a D4 in order to use this ability. Determining if something succeeds and how well it does is really straightforward. There are no errant modifiers or proficiencies. You simply roll the associated die and consult a table. This goes for the damage you do when you hit a creature with something unless it's stated otherwise. On a 1 to 2, you fail or succeed with a major cost. 3 to 4, you succeed, but there is a minor cost. And a 5 plus, you greatly succeed. The higher the result, the better. Like I said, dealing damage follows the same pattern. 1 to 2, you deal 1 hit. 3 to 4, you deal 2 hits. And 5 plus, you deal 3 hits. You might be thinking at this point, what the hell am I supposed to do if all my die get decreased to D4s? Well, in that case, you have two options. The first is catch your breath. Catching your breath resets all your skills to their original dies, skills, not artifacts, and gives you another use of grit. This can be done at any point in the game, even in the middle of combat, but it adds a complication to whatever you're doing. Here's an example from the rules. As the demon lord towers over the group, Harbell, the sinker, is manning their turret with and unleashes a barrage of bullets at the monstrous fiend. Harbell quickly realizes that their skills are pretty low and they want to catch their breath before taking their next action. Doing so resets all their skills to their initial ratings. As a complication, the GM describes that just as the demon is about to strike, it vanishes into thin air. The group knows it's still there, lurking in the shadows. All in shock, everyone is wondering what other dark powers and plans this monster holds in store for them. When you're in a secure place and have time in front of you, you can take an actual rest and reset your skills, artifacts, and resilience, and get any uses of grit back. I know I've mentioned grit twice now, so let's break it down. Grit allows you to perform a feat of pure power and determination. When doing a check, you can replace the die associated with the skill or item with a d12. You follow the same table to determine if you succeed or fail and to what degree. Once you've used grit, you have to either catch your breath or take a rest to get it back. Those of you that are familiar with D&D, Orbital Blues, Blades in the Dark, Pathfinder, Starfinder, etc., you're familiar with the concept of advantage and disadvantage. Stoneburner also has those titled Upper Hand and Lower Hand. When there are things in this fictional world that can grant you advantage, you have the upper hand and you can roll your dice twice and take the higher. When there are things making your life particularly challenging, you can roll your dice twice and take the lower. I think it's about time we talk about loot and the things you can do with your money. 
As you're exploring, you can loot the area around you to find rare magical artifacts or gear. At the start of each expedition, your loot die is a d12. Each time you loot a room, you roll your die, consult the table about the number you rolled, and then decrease your die all the way down to a d4 eventually. So on a 1 to 2, there's trouble ahead. On a 3 to 4, you get a d4 item. On a 5 to 6, you get a d6 item. And on a 7 to 8, you get a d8 item. 9 to 10, you get a d10 item. And 11 to 12, you get a d12 item. If you return from your excursion, you can sell the items you found. The type of die it is is important because you'll be rolling to determine the price of the item. Let's say I got a d10 item. Let's roll about it. Okay, I got an 8, which means that this item sells for 200 credits or 400 credits if I'm playing the game by myself. Credits can be used to buy gear, um, artifacts, purchase buildings to rebuild your home, and probably even at the GM discretion be used to increase your project die in one way or another. You're able to take on long-term projects to acquire or forge items like magical artifacts or some gear. All project die start at a D4, and as you interact with the world, you can try to increase it. Perhaps you're making a weapon and are able to use a blacksmith's workshop, changing that D4 to a D6. When you feel like you're ready to finish the project, you roll its current die and consult the project table to determine what happens. Now, I mentioned previously resilience, health, and damage hits, but let's dive in a little bit further around combat. With only four types of actions you can take during combat and tracking the turn order being heavily simplified, combat won't be a sloth and will go by pretty quickly. Uh, turn order is determined by who starts the fight. If a group of demons attack you, they go first and then you go next. The group that goes last gets to decide who goes first. So barring any weird strategic decisions, who gets to go first and last changes each round. The four things you can do in combat is change the battlefield to try and get the upper hand or cause your enemies to get the lower hand. When I played the game this past Friday and was fighting a demon, I could have said, oh, I light the webbing on fire, it was a spider demon thing, so that the demon is distracted and I get the upper hand next round, or to make sure it had the lower hand this round. I didn't do either of those things, and <laughs> subsequently, I did die. <laughs> The next thing you can do is attack an enemy. Using a skill or an artifact, you can also activate an ability or move a great distance. There's no need to track distance in this game, save for your own records, but if you're trying to move somewhere with a lot of distance between you and the target, you can spend your whole turn getting there. When engaging in combat, you will obviously have to fight stuff. The way enemies are handled is pretty similar to the way your character works. They get facets, which help highlight their thematic identity. And when they get the lower and upper hand, they get resilience, although they have a much wider range from 3 to 21. They get strength to attack and a wider range of die from a D4 to a D12. However, they can use their strength die as much as they want without decreasing it. The only time an enemy has to decrease that die is if they need to pay for the cost of an ability. Let's take a moment to look at some of the fucking demons you can come up against. Yes, look at that thing. It has a fucking machine gun. I'm so fucking scared right now. <sighs> okay, back on topic, right? You know how on the show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, you could phone a friend to help you out? Well, got a question you want to ask? Curious if, if a decision is risky or not? Check in with an oracle. There are two types of oracle roles. For simple yes or no questions like, is this person friendly? Does this tunnel lead anywhere? You check in with the question oracle and you choose a die based on how positive you think the outcome is. A d4 is very unlikely. A d6 is unlikely. A d8 is likely. A d10 is very likely. And a d12 is almost certain. After choosing the die, you roll and interpret the answers as such. One to two, the answer is no and... Three to four, the answer is yes, but. And five plus, the answer is yes, and. Now, make sure to actually take into account the ands or but to strengthen the world building and the story you're telling, right? Uh, this process is the exact same. Well, the process is pretty much similar when you're trying to determine if a task is risky or not. You ask the risk oracle and you choose a die from a D4 to a D8, depending on how likely you think the situation will be risky. However, if you're unsure, choose a D8 just to be safe and then roll to figure out what you're being told. On a one to two, the, situ is, the situation is not risky. You simply do it. On a three to four, the situation is risky. You need to make a check. And on a five plus, the situation is perilous. You need to make a check. Now, the final part in playing the game is visions of glory. Dwarves are often sent visions from their ancestors, offering guidance as they face challenges. At the end of each game, you'll receive a vision of glory, assuming you survived, <laughs> giving you a glimpse into the future. After this happens, you decide what you want to happen with your character or the group in the next session and add it to your character sheets. If at any point during the game, your vision comes to fruition, you gain an advancement. When an advancement happens, you roll 1d20 and whatever advancement you roll is the one you get. 
Each advancement can only be used once and it's a permanent effect. If you roll duplicates, you can choose another vision. Sorry, y'all. You can choose another result from the table. Now, while Visions of Glory is the last part of the game play for a session, but let's talk about one final thing, the long belt and actually exploring it. World and event generation is really simple. You take all your dice and you roll them on a piece of paper. After they've been rolled, draw lines around the dice that are near each other to make different sectors. Do not change the number the dice landed on. Wherever your D20 landed is the starting point for your adventure. And then you consult each table that corresponds with the die. So D4 table, D6 table, D8 table, etc. And the number the die rolled to determine what is in that sector. After you've gotten your map all set up, you can check out the sector events to determine what happens while you're there. In a solo game, you definitely want to roll the D20, but if you're running for people, picking isn't a bad idea. When I played it solo, I died, so I didn't get any visions of glory, but I went through almost every other mechanic. I forgot that I was able to describe the world in such a way that could give me the upper hand or the enemy the lower hand and died as a result. But overall, it was a fast paced game. Combat was over really quick and I can't wait to play some more. And while I haven't gotten the chance to run the game as a storyteller, the ease of learning the system has me excited to introduce others to it. I'm a big fan of collaborative world building that is baked into the game and can't wait to have my players take the reins and describe something in a room that gives them the upper hand or gives the lower hand to someone else. If you liked what I had to say in this review, please go check out the Kickstarter live now. And if you're waiting to play, if you're wanting to play in a game of Stoneburner, you can head over to bit.ly slash Legacy to check out the game live on my start playing that game page. It's $20 a session and anyone that shows proof they've pledged a tier that has rewards tied to it gets a 10% discount off of a session. Happy gaming.